Well, folks, the patch notes are here, and man, we've got some big changes to get through in this one. 20 cards getting uh, changed. We've got nerfs to, to major top tier decks, key stuff like Prince Renathal, as you can see behind me, and some buffs to Death Knight as well. So we're gonna go through these a little quicker than normal, maybe a little less analysis, more just covering what's happening. And uh, yeah, there's a lot. So let's kick it off with Prince Renathal here. He's now gonna read your deck size is 40, your starting health is 35. So really cutting his bonus here in half. And I think that's gonna have a, a notable impact. There will be decks that are definitely aren't willing to sacrifice the uh, consistency of a 30 card deck for only five health. That's just not gonna buy them enough extra time or upside. I think there will still be some control decks who don't really care about specific key cards being found or combos being found where they're like, yeah, okay, fine, five health, whatever. I'll still take that five health bonus because my deck doesn't really lose much by playing 240. So uh, I think we'll see Prince Renathal less of that kind of like jack of all trades where he's showing up at a handful of different things, random assortments of stuff, and probably be more specific to more control oriented, more uh, greedy sorts of decks as opposed to just a little bit of everything mid-range as he is now. So for Rogue, Rogue is actually getting four nerfs, kicking off with some of the Miracle Rogue stuff. Necrolord Draka is going from four mana to five mana. This is essentially gonna make it just a little bit harder to uh, get that Necrolord Draka going as early. You might have to delay it by a turn, or depending on how many cards you're trying to weave in, the dagger might just end up being, you know, a, a point smaller, a couple points of attack smaller sometimes, depending on how cards do line up so uh both pushing this back and pulling it down a little bit from power level that's gonna make a difference i still think this deck's really really good and we'll still have some absolutely obscene early dracas and we'll still steal games on occasion so i don't think miracle rogue's gonna go away on the back of this change and the next change that we have but definitely pushing it back a turn or two are gonna allow other decks more room to compete against some of the obscene stuff you see here by either developing taunt, finding their weapon removal, or just counter pressuring before the rogue can really start to do their crazy stuff. So the other side of the Miracle Rogue changes are for Sinstone Graveyard here going to three mana instead of two mana. And, uh, you know, for the turn you're popping off of the Sinstone Graveyard, this is not as likely to be impactful. I think usually the Sinstone Graveyard is played a turn ahead and then your pop-offs happen later of course sometimes it'll happen same turn which would slow this down a little bit so there will still be the opportunity to have as big of ghosts it'll just happen a turn later perhaps where you have to spend an entire turn three playing your sinstone graveyard which might also mean you know you're losing more tempo on more important turns so your opponent might have more time to counter pressure and your big stuff's going to come down a turn later so will it be fast enough i still think this is going to be a good card sometimes these ghosts are absolutely obscene and and often you know on turn four turn five it's still good enough to win a game on the back of some big ghosts so uh you know even though this goes to three i still think this will actually remain a pretty powerful card so moving on to the other side of the rogue changes we've got some death riddle rogue changes here sketchy information going to four mana instead of three mana both pushing this back a turn but man having to commit an entire four mana turn to this effect that feels really punishing to me because that's when a lot of decks are hitting their power band in the mid game. They're creating a ton of pressure. They're starting to swarm you down with stuff. And if you have to spend an entire four mana on a sketchy information, I think that's going to feel a lot worse than three, even though it's only that one additional mana just because the turns it's happening. Of course, Rogue does have ways to cheese these into play sooner with things like prep, but still uh, your total mana expenditure on the sketchy itself is going to require a bigger tempo sacrifice in many cases, not to mention this deck does need to get out ahead as fast as it can, getting those wide boards early so that other decks don't have as much time to find removal or that counter pressure necessary. So I actually think this is a pretty significant nerf. Something about this one feels really punishing to me, pushing sketchy to four. I think Death Row is gonna have some problems uh, getting things together quite as easily after this change. The other side of the rogue changes here are Forsaken Lieutenant to three mana instead of two. And uh, this minion's pretty key in the Death Row Rogue decks because it allows you to often activate your Death Rattles immediately because this becomes a copy with Rush. So sometimes otherwise you just play your Death Rattles down, your opponent might ignore them not setting off any kind of Death Rattle chains for your Infectious Ghoul or your uh, Taunt Burning Blade Accolade guys, Acolyte guys. But with Forsaken Lieutenant, you can fix those problems because you can trade it in immediately. 
then start summoning those five eights with taunts. So making that just a little bit more expensive is again gonna slow down Death Rattle Rogue decks, I'm sure, and give them a little bit less of that immediacy sometimes, or at least demand, again, more tempo sacrifice in order to do that. So again, I, I think this is actually a rather noteworthy change here for only one mana. I think Death Rattle Rogue is gonna be a lot weaker after this, which is probably a good thing. The deck's pretty gross on what it does. So next up, moving here over to Druid, we've got a new Brakan getting changed. Instead of all your minions costing armor instead of mana, now with a new Brakan, it's only going to be your next three minions cost armor instead of mana, which does matter because sometimes that deck could go absolutely crazy gross pop-offs like playing a Bran and then like multiple Astalor chains or some under kings to get additional armor and then finishing off with a big Astalor or a big Denathrius or something and just absolutely murdering you. So playing five cards, for instance, might not be crazy at all in this uh, sort of game plan, but by limiting it to three, that's really gonna reduce the ability to create those absurd chains or those big lethal pushes for Anubrakan. This might limit the card a little bit more to a kind of tempo swing card, or at least pull down the power level of those turns. So they feel a little bit more easier uh, to handle or you know easier to survive in essence than they do currently but still allowing this card to to realize some cool counter swing potential and some armor synergy so uh this feels like a pretty neat change to me i like this one so moving over to demon hunter here we've got unleash fell going for mana thirst four to mana thirst six for its lifesteal application the way this card's being used right now is with spell damage minions giving this plus two spell damage where it becomes this just obscene uh, board clear effect that's also a reno often because of the lifesteal where it's you know easily hitting four or five targets it's healing for you know 12 15 health healing you back to full sometimes even more of course when the stars align or you have multiples of these so pushing the mana thirst back to six i think gives this the a little bit of uh, less of that crazy survivability potential that it currently has or if you need to tidy up a board on turn four uh, you're not only going to wipe out your opponent's aggro start, but you're going to just go back to full health and that could often, you know, close the door on aggro decks. This pushing it to six means that's going to have to happen a little bit later if you want to use this for survivability. Still a good late game tool, but not as much in that early to mid game where many uh, aggro or board based decks would really be swarming you down. So uh, I guess they didn't want this to be, you know, a Reno spell that did face damage and removed a million minions. Uh, spell Demon Hunter, particularly at higher ranks of play, was really good. We saw this uh, just absolutely tearing up in the World Championship, for instance, uh, deck pretty much everybody brought and was winning a lot of games. So not too surprising here, especially at the top end of the meta. So next up for Demon Hunter, we have Relic of Dimensions going to six. I personally love this change. Uh, right now, Relic of Dimensions could just get way too many big discounts, making a lot of stuff zero mana, so it would often pay for itself in essence right away. Sometimes it would do even more if you've played enough Relics or had your location rolling. So, you know, discounting stuff by four or five mana, getting four cards sometimes when you activate this with a Relic, discounting them all by a billion, that's just too much mana cheat, especially when it hit wind conditions like Spell Damage Minions or Jace, for instance. So delaying that by a turn, making that a bigger upfront commitment, I think that's a good change that will help reduce some of the absurdity of this card. Although frankly, I think it will still be pretty darn good at six mana just because of how much mana it can cheat. Moving over to Priest, these might be changes that surprise uh, the average player, I would say, because Priest is not a deck, Spell Priest or whatever you wanna call it, Radiant Elemental Priest, Buff Priest, is not a deck that's, that's really good at lower ranks, but is very good at higher ranks of play. Again, one that showed up a lot. Uh, in the world championships arguably the best deck in the game at, at legend top 1000 right now if we look for instance bless priest is number two and only 0 0.02 percent behind miracle rogue so some changes here that prevent some of the obscenely big stuff that comes out of bless priest turns will they'll play some radiant elementals make a giant thing with serpent wigs and other buffs and then copy it with boon of the ascended so priestess valish is going to one mana here to help uh slow down some of that mana regain that is possible for that tech where they'll play four or five spells and then just get to go again for a second wave and go absolutely nuts and then we've also got boon of the ascended here going to five mana this is the one that would allow you to create you know too many big things sometimes making one big thing uh would be fine but then if you get the second one and it's actually pretty cheap to play because you've got some radiant elementals in play 
uh, that would be overwhelming for people. Like, yeah, I could deal with one tin tin, but it's the second one. Or tin tin's not even really that big. Often it's like, I can deal with one 14 18 or something, but I can't deal with a second 14 18 in this deck. So, delaying that again by a turn here for Boon of the Ascended will help slow this deck down just a little bit more, giving more people uh, time to get under those giant minions, kill that priest before they're able to do this, or more time to find answers. Uh, that they need to handle these gigantic minions. So probably some important changes there for the top of the meta. So then our final nerf here, if you want to call it that, is Tome Tampering. It's getting banned in wild. Discard Warlock with Tome Tampering is wreaking havoc on wild format. Uh, this is a good change, obvious change, I think. Uh, they've done this multiple times with Warlock cards in the past now. Uh, this card's pretty cool for standard. It's fun, it's meme -y. it's not a danger in standard. So nerfing it would feel bad. That means banning it is a great solution because that is a specific ban to wild while allowing this card to be cool in standard format. So happy to see this one. I think wild players will rejoice in regards to this change. So then moving on, we have some buffs to Death Knight here. And in particular, I think the theme of these buffs is getting more corpses and making your corpse spending uh, easier and or better. For instance, your Corpse Bride is now gonna be able to spend up to 10 corpses instead of just eight, which means she can now make a 10-10 instead of an 8-8. I haven't played this card a ton, but when I did, I have to say my experience was that, you know, sometimes it wasn't about like having the cap, especially if you're playing this on turn five, it might be hard to already to get to eight corpses. If you already played some other corpse spending card, say in an unholy deck, for instance, you might not have eight corpses left. Sometimes this was making like a four, four or five, five. So I don't know how often the cap increase here is actually gonna matter as a turn five play, maybe later in the game. If this comes down, you might get a 10, 10. That said, functionally, is the difference between an 8-8 and a 10-10 really all that big? Because if the opponent is answering the 8-8 with whatever spell or removal thing, they're probably also gonna be able to answer a 10-10. So I, I'm left a little quizzical about this change. I don't see it being very impactful on curve and I don't really see it being impactful in the late game either because those two stats probably just don't really add up to that much difference the later this gets played. So, I don't know, maybe people out there with a little more experience playing this card have, have better insights. If you, if, you've, if you think this is going to make a big change, you're always going to get a 10-10 on turn 5, and for some reason that, that extra 2-2 in stats is going to be meaningful, I guess share those thoughts in the comments below. I'd be curious to hear those insights, because as I see this one, I just don't really think this changes much at all about this card in, in practice. I don't, I don't see it. So next up here we have Malignant Horror, and I think this change seems a little more reasonably useful. Uh, now Malignant Horror is only gonna require four corpses instead of five to summon a copy, and that's probably pretty meaningful here. I could imagine a handful of scenarios where you've managed to get to four, but you don't quite get to five by turn four. Of course, this doesn't line up perfectly for like a one, two, three curve if you're playing one minion each per turn, but there are obviously various ways for, for a Death Knight to get extra corpses weaved in by turn four. And I could see some scenarios where this is, is notably different and four is much easier to get to than five. And when this does go off, I think this is a pretty neat card. Also noteworthy is that this does demand a reload if you want it to keep going turn after turn. So that's a little bit less of a tax or overhead over time as well if you're trying to get multiple procs of the malignant horror or scenarios where your opponent's like trying to punish you by keeping one of these alive and eating your corpses for a non-reborn version, for instance. Those sorts of scenarios are a little bit less punishing if this is eating up less of your corpse totals. Plus, we're gonna see a change too that just straight up gives you four corpses now instead of three uh, on curve with this due to the meat grinder. So that might be a really important one-two punch as well. And here it is, what do you know, meat grinder is now gonna give you four corpses instead of three. So there might be a world where you play meat grinder on three, even if you haven't generated any corpses so far, that's gonna set you up for your turn four malignant horror. I'm still not really convinced by meat grinder as a card. I don't think this feels all that great to play. Again, I mean, you know, I've played a fair bit of Death Knight, but I'm happy to, to crowdsource some opinions on this one as well. If you guys have had better experiences with meat grinder, and if you think the three versus four uh, breakpoint's gonna be a huge change here, I'm curious to hear that. I really only see these cards maybe in, in consequence with another being good, but is that a perfect curve or would you rather play hand buff stuff or the Malignant Horror? Would you rather have other setup plays? I think I'd rather have other setup plays. I don't know that Malignant Horror is a reason for Meat Grinder to be good. And I don't know that one corpse 
is enough reason for Meat Grinder to be good over the previous version. So this actually seems like a fairly minimally useful change, whereas the Malignant Horror change feels like the best that we've talked about so far. That said, Stitched Giant here is going to go down to 9 mana instead of 10. Uh, so getting him out a little bit faster if you're spending your corpses. Now, interestingly enough, uh, we've got cards here getting changed that are spending less corpses, and there's, there's going to be additional ones as well. So it may actually end up feeling like the Stitch Giant costs about the same on average because your, your corpse spending could go down to compensate for his cost discount here, right? So uh, this might be less of a change about making Stitch Giant better, but maybe just keeping him up with the other changes we're going to see here. Uh, and of course, depending on other cards that aren't getting changes, perhaps Stitch Giant could occasionally be faster based on some other unchanged corpse spenders as well. But yeah, I mean, this is the kind of change uh, Death Knight's going to need to have a better win rate, particularly in, un in Unholy, which I think most of these changes so far have been focused on, even though these are non-rune cards, I think they still support Unholy rather nicely. But you need power spike plays like this, dropping a really cheap 8-8, it's the sort of thing that allows you to do that. So hopefully a change that's meaningful for Unholy to gain a little win rate here and there. And then finally, one more change here for Unholy. This one's pretty cool. Blightfang is getting a one health buff, which is minimal, but, but the thing is, Blightfang's already a pretty good card, I think. Blightfang's awesome and making him just a little bit better, giving you that extra little stickiness on board. Value trade into a 3-3. That can be a big deal when you're really trying to vie for the board by getting these 2-2s two out. So, uh, you know, small thing, yes, but already a, a really powerful card with high output, making it just a little bit higher. I like this in particular because it's a single Unholy Rune card. So having really high power cards like this available to other Rune types might encourage them to say, hey, look, I'm a control deck. I want a little I want a little board presence. I need some corpse generation. Maybe I can run a blight thing. Maybe he's so good now that it's worth it to run that single unholy rune. I think we need more cards to encourage that and blight thing here is the closest thing. It's kind of crazy to see a buff on a card that's already I think really good, but that's probably what Death Knight needs to open up different rune combinations. So next up here, another unholy change. Ymir, Dar Ymir Jar Deathbringer is going to four attack instead of three. And yeah, I mean, that's a nice little bonus. Sure, I think this card's actually pretty good. I underrated it at first, but uh, it does offer a lot of stickiness. This is basically making it a three mana piloted shredder with taunts. And that can be really impactful on board early. This can create some frustration, some negative trades for your opponent. And uh, if they don't handle it, it's just really high pressure as well. So some nice friction there where it's like, man, I want to kill this, but I want to give them a 3-3. Three, three. If I don't kill it, they're hitting me for four every turn. That starts to stack up. So uh, solid little change on a solid little card. Moving over to Frost, we've got the Rhyme Sculptor going to four. I think that's a lot less impactful than on the Ymir Jar. Uh, you know, this is much cheaper, so that stat matters a lot more in the early game than in the mid game. And this has taunt, so sometimes it can create some awkwardness. The Rhyme Sculptor, I don't really see the one attack here making much difference on a five mana card. It's nice, it's a freebie, but it doesn't really go that far at five mana. I, I don't think so. Usually if this is getting swept up, it's by a smaller minion or some really cheap removal. And that one extra attack is rarely ever actually going to connect and when it does, you know, it's so late in the game now at five mana, how much does one attack make a difference? Just doesn't seem to do much. So next up is Obliterate. This is a big change. Obliterate uh, no longer takes damage equal to the health of the minion, but now it's fixed at three damage. So I guess sometimes technically this could be worse if you killed, you know, one health minion or something. But very often if you're killing like an 8-8, for instance, this just becomes a you know, more or less free removal. Three damage you're happily going to sacrifice in many cases to kill something really, really big, and that's pretty nice. This is, again, another one, too, where this might be a really nice option as a single rune removal card for decks that are like, okay, I need some good removal in my Frost deck. Maybe I'm willing to dip into blood to get Obliterate. Now it's not as big of a risk and only three damage instead of eight or ten or whatever it would have been otherwise. So... Hopefully this is another big change that encourages multi-rune decks to have a little bit more options. Uh, these are the sort of things I think we want to see for that. And then finally, the last buff here is to Blood Tap. Uh, this one's going from spending three corpses to two corpses to get the additional portion of the buff on Blood Tap, which 
Uh, I mean, yeah, at, at, at two mana, this was a card that was really, really hard to have enough corpses to get going early in the game, particularly on turn two. Really, really tough to get three corpses on turn two. Maybe almost impossible, really. Um, but with two corpses, a little bit more possible. Now you say, like, play a body bagger on turn one. If your opponent kills it or you can trade it in on turn two, you might be able to actually activate your blood tap on turn two. And I think in many cases with hand buffs like this, the earlier you can get them going, certainly the better for some big like turn three or turn four plays to create uh, those high pressure boards in the mid game. These kind of stat things fall off the later the game you go. So if you're waiting until turn four to get enough corpses to play your blood tap, for instance, might be hard to swing things back, particularly without say like divine shields and paladin that give hand buffs often extra impact so i think this is actually a pretty notable change i don't know if this is gonna be enough to get a hand buff death knight off the ground i think that's still a, a deck archetype that really hasn't seen much success at all but it's a step in the right direction for sure and I'm, I'm excited to give it another look given this change so that said that is all the changes 20 cards getting changes the death knight buffs i mean i, I think there's a couple important ones obliterate i think it's a great change Emir Jar is probably going to be sneaky good at four. Blight Fang, I mean, that's that's helpful. It's already a good card. I, I'm not totally convinced these are going to be a huge impact. In particular, a lot of these cards are, I would say, fairly weak cards. I mean, given Unholy is probably the worst, least competitive of the, the Death Knight archetypes right now. Anyway, um, what, what can happen is sometimes, you know, like if, if the threshold for playability is here with Death Knight cards, a lot of these are lower than that threshold already. A couple, I think, are above it, like we talk about blitter eight play thing that sort of stuff but if you if you low if you raise them from down here if you if you make them all better they they still might not really hit the threshold for playability or if they do you know they might just be kind of even with it in other words it doesn't really make the class stronger in total uh, it just brought the bottom up but you kind of sometimes need to bring the mid or the top up to really make a class more competitive so I don't know that these are going to be enough to really rocket Death Knight into success, help it even find a, a good solid tier one deck, which I, I think might be Blizzard's goal. They probably want the class to feel strong. Um, but that said, might lay the groundwork or foundation for future changes, mini sets, next expansions, and so on. Uh, we can't really see the future of Death Knight, so these, these might be more about setting up for later, just making sure the class is positioned well moving down the road more than anything else. But still curious to try like hand buff, for instance, malignant horror plus blood tap could be a cool new thing that works well, given uh, the changes to these two sorts of cards. So that said, the nerfs, I think here are gonna make a pretty big impact, particularly rogue changes, gonna change things a lot. Renathal, of course, uh, really, really popular card. has really been the most popular card in Hearthstone since his release uh, by play rate. So, um, that's obviously gonna have some big impacts on the meta one way or another curious to see how that shakes out curious what you guys think about these changes if you want to see changes for like battlegrounds and arena and stuff uh check the link in the description below for the official patch notes i discovered the standard card changes here but um that's it thanks for watching and until next time game on